Well, it seems to be on, so I see the the door has uh, shut and opened, and uh, which it may mean that I stood here for 45 minutes and thought that I, you know, had taught class. But uh, but no, we we'll get started here, and appreciate everybody being here. If you remember, this is where we ended the last class. So somebody give us the quick background to where we get to this part where Paul is motioning with his hand and speaking in Hebrew. What had gotten him to this point? With the 4,000 assassins, right? right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's right. So Paul had gone to the temple and he's attacked by these Jews from Asia who have been sort of following him around. And so he's nearly killed and the the uh, soldiers rescue him, and they think he's this Egyptian who led 4,000 assassins into the desert, and he says, no, nope, that's not me, and can I talk? And they say, sure. And so he addresses in Hebrew, he says, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. So he's, he's in front of uh, basically be an all-Jewish audience here. And so he's starting to use some of their language, brothers and fathers, and they hear him speak in Hebrew, and why does that make them sort of uh, pay more attention to him, or at least get quieter? What would that matter? Yeah, you know, because he, imagine the, the rumors that have been spread about Paul. You know, he's doing all this stuff over with these Gentiles. Maybe he's not even a real, you know, Jewish, Jewish person here. You know, we don't know. And, and so all we know is he used to maybe be a persecutor or maybe that was somebody else. And, and so, oh, let's kill this guy. And now he starts talking to us in Hebrews. And we're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, he's one of us here. And so he says, look at his very first words, I am a Jew. Just, just to make that clear, I am a Jew brought up in this city. This city would be what city? Yeah, Jerusalem. So he's like, you know, I, I'm from this other place, but I grew up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God. Now, he says, as all of you are this day, what had all of those people that he's speaking to, what had they just tried to do to Paul? Kill it. Okay. So why would Paul say, you know, I was zealous for God, just like you, you know, when y'all were trying to, like, pull my arms and legs off, you know? Why, why would he say that? That's right. That's... <laughs> yeah, what Paul did to Christians is exactly what they're doing to him. And he was being very zealous. And so he says, I persecuted this way, meaning Christianity, to the death, binding and delivering to prison, men and women, and I'd bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. So he says, you know, what you guys are doing to me, this is what I did to Christians. And so I understand you. And again, there would be this sort of commonality where we go, huh, yeah, maybe, maybe there is some similarity here. And then he's telling this story, and, you know, not to, to look too far ahead, but there are two groups of people that make up the Jewish audience, what are the two groups? Pharisees and Sadducees, okay? And, and why do we call them Sadducees? Yeah, well, they don't believe in the resurrection, so they're sad, you see. And so Paul says, I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. 
So again, if you had heard rumors about this guy, Paul, my, my hunch is people are kind of like leaning forward, like, okay, I've heard about something about Jesus and a vision. And I want to hear it, particularly maybe the group that's not sad, you see. They, they might really be interested in this. And so the people around me saw the light, did not understand the voice. And then I say, what shall I do, Lord? And while the, the point of this subject that we're going over is not uh, salvation and evangelism, it is interesting when he says, what do I do? Jesus didn't say, what do you mean do? You don't do anything. You just like accept my grace. And, no, Jesus says, well, go to Damascus and you'll be told everything to do. Or think about you know, Acts 2.38. Right before then, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter didn't say, what do you mean do? There's nothing to do. No, he said, here's what you need to do. Repent, be baptized. So again, not our focus, but just a, an observation. And so then this guy, Ananias, comes up to Paul. Why is it important for Paul to establish sort of the credentials of this Ananias? Why didn't he say, uh, this Greek guy came up to me. This Gentile guy came up to me. Why, why talk about Ananias? What's that now? Yeah, Paul would have been heading to that city to get people like Ananias. But why is he pointing out that Ananias was a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews? credibility. So he says, look, you know, I used to be just like you guys. I'm speaking to you in Hebrew. I was raised by this, you know, educated by this great Jewish teacher. And I did all the things you do. And then I hear this voice and Jesus is saying, go into the city. And then this guy that all the Jewish people there just really think highly of. He came to me. He said, the God of our fathers so again, we're not talking about like Zeus or, you know, some Greek god, right? This is Jehovah. The God of our fathers appointed you, know his will, see the righteous one, hear a voice from his mouth. And then he says, rise and be baptized, wash away your sins. Again, not, not the purpose of this class to talk about this, but if you're ever discussing, you know, the idea of salvation with somebody and they say the sinner's prayer is how you're saved, you can point out, very simple observation. Paul, Saul, was saying the sinner's prayer for three days. Not eating, not drinking. And he still needed to be baptized for the remission of his sins. So let's go on with our story here. When I returned to Jerusalem praying in the temple, so how important would it be when he says, I fell into a trance or I had a vision, how important would it be that that occurred at the temple as opposed to somewhere else yeah credibility i mean the temple is like the claim to fame right this is this is everything at this time for the jewish people he says look i'm in the temple i fall into a trance i saw him so who is the him yeah jesus saying to me make haste get out of jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony and i said lord they themselves know in one synagogue after another. So does that sound like this was an isolated thing that Paul did? Like one time he, he got one Christian? Now this is repetitive. I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. The blood of Stephen was being shed. I was standing by approving, watching over. And then he, so again, picture the scene. The, the Jews from Asia had sort of tracked him down. They say, this is the guy that we got to kill. And they would have killed him, but the soldiers come. And then Paul says, I want to speak in Hebrew. And I, I am more of a Jew than any of you can be. And then he gets to this point, And Jesus says, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So before we figure out what happens next, what would you hallucinate would happen if Paul says something like that? Yeah, heads would explode. Okay. So up to this word, they listened to him. Then they said, away from such a fellow from the earth, he should not be allowed to live. 
And so it's going absolutely just crazy in there. And so the Roman soldiers have to go rescue him. And what are the Romans? Uh, well, let's take a step back. How fluent do you think the average Roman is in Hebrew? Yeah, probably not much. If you had some understanding of it, and you're listening to this, are you like fully following what's happening? Probably not. Like, okay, I got something about, you know, zealous and the way and Gentiles, and then everything went crazy. And so the Tribune says, we got to get to the bottom of this. So I got all these people that have been beating this guy, Paul. Now they want to kill him again. So I could either question them or I could question Paul. So who does he decide to question? Paul. And does that say, hey, let's sit down together, maybe a nice cup of iced tea and, and we'll chat? Is that how he's going to question Paul? Yeah, this is, you know, you're stretched out and we're going to beat you until you tell us why the mob was trying to beat you, <laughs> which seems a little ironic to me. Yeah, if we're the Romans, our objective is peace for the sake of peace, but also for the sake of what every April 15th? Taxes. I mean, you can't run an empire on goodwill. you got to have money, okay? And so that's if, if we have riots and chaos, tax revenue goes down, expenses go up. Not good if you are in charge. So they stretched him out for the whips. Paul says to the centurion, he asked him a very simple question. He doesn't make a threat. He doesn't make a statement. He asks a question. What's the question? Yeah, so, you know, he, he doesn't say anything while they're marching him there. They stretch him out. They get the whip, and then he just casually says, is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen uncondemned? Now, what's the obvious answer to that question no so look at what the centurion does <laughs> to me this is funny how the book of acts really gives us sort of these are real people okay centurion goes to a tribune and say what are you about to do <laughs> for this man is a roman citizen now the tribune wasn't there with the whip right i mean we get the sense the centurion has to go find him and says by the way what are you about to do and then the tribune comes in and says to Paul, are you a Roman citizen? Yes. And he says, I bought my citizenship for a large sum. And Paul says, what? I was born. Yeah. That doesn't mean a whole lot to us. I mean, there are some countries where they would say you can't buy it. But if you make a big enough investment in real estate, you can get sort of a dual citizenship. But you know, we get the clear implication, which is more prestigious, to have bought your citizenship or to have been born into it? Yeah, to be born. Even for us, it makes a difference. You know, um, Arnold, you know, the former governor, actor, you know, he's an American citizen. Can he be president? No, he wasn't born. And so it makes a difference, even to us. And so, verse 29, they withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized Paul was a Roman citizen. He had bound him. So here we see the tribune going, I have made an enormous miscalculation here. Now, we talked about this last week. When Paul talked to the tribune, what did he leave out? <laughs> yeah, he left out that part. I don't know why. You know, maybe there was some good reason for it, maybe not. But anyway, the Tribune had no idea this was a Roman citizen, and he's just figured this out. Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us exactly. What can we sort of uh, deduce from this would be, is the Tribune under threat of punishment for doing this, or is this no big deal? Yeah, it, it's a big deal. He's scared. <laughs> he's like, oh my goodness, if this gets out, this is going to be really, really bad. 
So then the next day, desiring to know the real reason why Paul was being accused, he unbound him. I, I don't take that to mean he left Paul like handcuffed the whole night because it seemed like he realized that was a problem. It probably, probably means we, we're bringing you out of your cell, so to speak. And commanded the chief priests all the council to meet, brought Paul down, set him before them. So here we go. Think about when we were introduced to, to Saul He's full of zeal. He is very thorough, very determined. Then as we see him on his first missionary journey, there's this guy named Bar-Jesus, sort of this magician who is opposing Paul. And do you remember that scene where Paul pulls him aside and says, you know, I know you had a tough childhood. I really want to emphasize. I can't say that word. <laughs> I want to sympathize. We'll say it that way. I want to really understand what's going on in your life, and, and I want to be very gentle with you. Is that how Paul treated that guy? You know, remember he looks at him and says, you son of the devil, you always, you know, and he's very harsh. And so looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I've lived my life before God, and I'll get conscience up to this day. And the high priest tells somebody standing next to Paul to do what? Yeah. Uh, on the shoulder, right? Like, hey, you know, where, where are they, where's he want him hit? Yeah, like punch him in the mouth. You know, this guy, if he's willing to say after the previous day, the Lord sent me to the Gentiles, and now he says, I've lived in all good conscience. No, we got to stop this. And so how would you predict Paul would react to the high priest telling somebody to punch him in the mouth? <laughs> yeah, not well, okay? So here's the reaction. Now remember, the high priest says, okay, so think about it this way. You've got God, and you've got man, and where's the high priest? In the middle. So here the high priest says to another man, strike Paul in the mouth. And what does Paul say is going to happen? God's going to strike you, high priest, in the mouth. God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You'll remember that from Jesus, used that expression. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? So on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being Paul is like, you know, in a complete blissful state, and 10 is he's enraged. Where is Paul right now? <laughs> 11, okay. I mean, Paul is really, really fired up. And here's a, a little passage from Deuteronomy 25. I don't know if this is what he was talking about, but this would be something similar. So if somebody's accused of something, a judge will decide. And then, if you're guilty, then you get the beating. What, what was the high priest trying to do here? Now, they'd already been beaten him, okay, but this is sort of more official. You know, the high priest is like, I, I demand that you be struck in the mouth. Well, he hasn't been found guilty of anything. So I think Paul was right. And I just have these two examples. Remember Moses described as the meekest man on the earth? And this is after the, uh, or right before the 10th plague, and it says he leaves Pharaoh in hot anger. Now, there's other times where Moses was very, very upset. Like at the, when he gets the Ten Commandments and he comes down and they're worshiping, you know, the golden calf. And, and Moses is just like really furious at that point. But that's an example. And then even Jesus, when they were wondering, will it? and he asked him a very reasonable question. Verse 4, is it lawful on the Sabbath, do good or do harm, save life or kill? And they were silent. He looks around with anger. So anger in and of itself is not wrong. Now what's the danger of anger? Yeah, we go too far. We you know, lose control. So here's the response back to Paul. So remember, the high priest says, strike him. And Paul says, God's going to strike you. And then somebody says, hey, Paul, would you revile God's high priest? Because there's a, a rule or a law that, that you should not do that, okay? So, is that a legitimate question to ask Paul? 
I mean, Paul's just said, God's going to, you know, strike you down, basically. And so, let's, let's kind of think through this. Paul says, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. So what do you think? Is that a true statement? Is he being sarcastic? Does he have really bad eyes? And he, like, I, I thought that was somebody else that said that. What do you think? Did he know that was a high priest or did he not know? Okay. And if you remember, before he said that, what did he do intently to the council? He looked at him. Now maybe it's because he had bad eyes and he's like, I really can't see anything, but I'm going to... Okay. So we got one person says... I think he knew who the high priest was. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I might be remembering this correctly. At some point, there was a few of the Right. You know, that's a good question. I don't remember uh, in this particular situation if we had that. But yes, you're right. There was... A time, if you, not to compare this to the Catholic Church, but to compare it to the Catholic Church, there were times where there were multiple popes. Well, which pope are you going to follow? So that could be it. But he says, For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So maybe this is just me. I've always read this as being incredibly sarcastic. That Paul's going, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was the high priest. I mean, what kind of high priest would command me to be struck against the law? But, you know, you shouldn't say anything bad about the high priest. It'd sort of be like if you were, you know, we, we just had a, a case with uh, Donald Trump argued in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And imagine if one of the Supreme Court justices said, hey, if you'll pay me $10 million, I'll vote in your favor. And then somebody goes, you should arrest that guy. He's a crooked judge. And somebody goes, you're not supposed to speak ill of the Supreme Court justice. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was Supreme Court justice. He just tried to bribe me. That's how I take it. Maybe Paul really didn't know, but we see Paul is going to react pretty quickly here, whatever the, the truth of the matter is. He perceives one part were Sadducees, the other part were Pharisees, and once he makes that connection in his mind where he goes, you know, over there, Sadducees, Pharisees, what does he say? I'm a Pharisee. <laughs> a son of Pharisees. You know, I guess that's better than just being a first generation Pharisee. I'm, you know, long standing Pharisee here. It's with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial. So, again, I ask you the statement. Is that a true statement? Is he just being very clever here? Is he being truthful? Is he being both? What do you think? Both? Okay. I heard somebody say very truthful. Okay. Why do you think this is a true statement? Yeah, what about this deal about the hope and resurrection of the dead? How... <laughs> so let me ask you this. When he was in Athens and he was talking to them and they said, hey, we want to hear more about this because this is really weird. What was he talking about? Resurrection. resurrection. He's always talking about the resurrection. Let's see, Matt. Well, it's tricky because the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. The Pharisees did, but they did not believe in a one-time resurrection. They believed in a one-time resurrection. Yeah, this this is sort of a complicated subject here. I think, uh, do you have something? Sir? Yeah, and, and remember, he's saying, I, I was talking to this guy that died, right? This Jesus who died, he's like talking to me from heaven. And, and so this whole thing is about the resurrection. 
In verse 7, when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and Sadducees. The assembly was divided. And in this, I think it's funny. Like right after that comment, some of the Pharisees say, you know, what if he spoke, if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? Now, did a spirit or angel speak to Jesus? Or I'm sorry, to Paul? That was a Freudian scene. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe something more than an angel or a spirit, right? This is like beyond their imagination of what could happen. And so they're saying, hey, maybe, maybe he did hear from a, a spirit or an angel, so we should listen, and the Sadducees are you know, not real happy about this. So the Tribune, afraid he'd be torn to pieces. Does that give us an idea of how chaotic this is? One time I saw on the news, I don't even know, what is it called like the House of Commons or something in, in England where they're like yelling at each other and pounding on the tables? And, you know, I would think this is much more intense than that. But this is not a, uh, a very, you know, subdued business meeting here. <laughs> this, is, this is very uh, violent because the Tribune says, okay, soldiers, go down there and get him so he's not torn apart. And so then Jesus speaks to Paul, and we've seen this before. What does he say to Paul, and what's the implication? Yeah, you're going to make it out of this, but first I want you to take courage, which would imply what? It's going to be tough, and maybe he needs a little courage. Maybe he is discouraged, and so Jesus is encouraging him. And then he says... And by the way, you're going to testify in Rome. Now, if any of you like to read business books, there's kind of a book that has some popularity called Who Not How. So you, you need to get something done. You don't figure out how to do it. You figure out who can do it. Well, this is sort of a version of that. Where, not how. Okay? So you're going to go to Rome, but at least what's recorded, does Jesus explain to Paul how you're getting to Rome? Or when you're getting to Rome? I mean, if it was me, I might think, okay, so I guess a ship's coming the next day for me. And that might not be what happened here. So, verse 12, the, uh, how disappointed are at least the violent faction of the Jews here that Paul is still alive? Yeah, they want to kill him. Now, you know, sometimes we can have a desire and then sometimes we can really like burn the ships type of desire. How strong is their desire to kill Paul? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to drink until this guy's dead, which to me, I'm like, well, you better get him pretty quick because, you know, you're going to get real thirsty in the Middle East, you know. And so it says there were more than 40 and they go to the chief priest and say, we strictly bound ourselves by an oath, taste no food till we kill Paul. And they, basically the plot is, hey, tell the tribune to bring Paul down again and we'll kill him on the way. Now think about those 40 people, more than 40. Is it likely if they were successful in killing Paul that they could just go back to their normal lives? Yeah, I mean, these were, these were men that said, we feel so strongly about this, we're going to not eat, not drink, and we're going to throw our lives away. It's worth it to kill Paul. And so pretty serious, pretty dedicated people here. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Good question. I'm sure there was some technicality, like if it becomes impossible to fulfill your oath, then you're released from the oath, and you know, then you start guzzling water like crazy. All right, now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, and so he went to the barracks and told Paul. So is this just purely coincidence that Paul's nephew overhears this, or do you view this as providence of God? Yeah, I would sort of lean toward providence. So if God opens a door of opportunity for us, do we say, well, that's great. Okay, bring it to me. Or do we say, okay, God's opened a door of opportunity. Now I need to go do something. 
And we can see what Paul does here. He doesn't say, well, you know, God told me I'm going to get to Rome, so nothing I need to do. No, he, he starts taking action. That's what we see all through the Bible. You know, we have belief plus action. Always, always there's action. And so he calls one of the centurions and says, take this young man to the tribune. He has something to say. And so he does that. And look at the tribune. It's just, you know, why does the Holy Spirit give us this little detail? It says he takes the young man by the hand, going aside, asks him privately, what is it you have to tell me? What do you take from that about the tribune? Just that little detail. Okay, compassionate. <laughs> Maybe he's still a little scared. You know, this deal with Paul and a Roman. And so then verses 20 through 21, we have, you know, basically a, a repeat of here's what's going to happen. Now, the tribune could have said, well, you know, if they kill Paul, that kind of solves my problem. <laughs> you know, of binding a Roman. But verse 22, he dismisses the young man, says, tell no one you've informed me. And then he calls to the centurions and says, basically get a pretty large percentage of our forces here and we're leaving tonight. Okay, or you guys are leaving tonight. And so he's got, depends on how you count it. Maybe it's 200 soldiers plus 70 horsemen or maybe it's, 200 soldiers and 200 spearmen and 70 uh, horsemen. And they had mounts, like plural, you know, get sense you're sort of maybe changing mounts here for Paul to ride, bring him safely to Felix the governor. And then he writes a letter. And, and I want to spend just a moment on this letter because, again, what we see in the Bible, these are real people. These are not cardboard characters, these are not two dimensional characters, these are real people. And so let's go through this letter and see for each thing he says, is it true or is it untrue? So he's talking to Felix. I always got him confused. Felix and Festus, just alphabetical. Felix comes first and then Festus. So this man was seized by the Jews. True or false? True. Okay, so far so good. Was about to be killed by them. Yeah, that's true. I came upon them with the soldiers. True? Remember, he heard there was a riot, and so he runs with all of his soldiers, and I rescued him. Well, did he let him die, or did he rescue him? <laughs> okay, so he rescued him. I mean, they beat him up some, but he rescued him. Having learned he was a Roman citizen, <laughs> it, there's truth in that statement, but he's, he's sort of recalculated the time-space continuum here, okay? I mean, what's the clear implication of this? I rescued Paul because I knew he was a Roman citizen, which is absolutely not true. And then, desiring to know the charge, I brought him down. I found he's being accused about questions of their law, but nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And then there was a plot, and so I wanted you to, to get him right away and have the charges brought against him. So overall, pretty truthful, right? Except that one little timing detail. What does that timing detail do to the Tribune? Well, the way he wrote it. Makes him look good. He, every man's a hero in his own story, right? <laughs> And so he's like, look at what I did. And maybe that would make it harder for somebody to say, you know, the Tribune, he stretched this guy out, was about to beat this Roman. And, uh, you know, and, and I don't know if that's part of why he was so quick in saving Paul. Like, hey, this never happened, Paul. <laughs> I don't know if that's what he was trying to do. But in any event, it, it's just interesting. The Holy Spirit could have said, and Paul arrived. But the Holy Spirit goes through this time to say, and he said this and this and, oh, this one right here. It's a little, a little questionable there on the accuracy of it. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul. So they do what they're supposed to. And then this governor says, when your accusers get here, 
then, then we'll see what's going on. So that's really our text for tonight, Wednesday be chapter 24 and 25. What I'd like to do is, what do you learn from this that's practical? I mean, to me, this is interesting, like all the detail that, that is given to us. It could have been two sentences. Paul was seized in the temple and then was transferred to Felix because there was a plot against him. But this goes on, you know, for two chapters. So why? What are we supposed to get out of this? Yeah, I mean, God can can certainly work in very unusual ways, and you know we're so Paul is is not quite to Rome yet, and we're going to see there's kind of a long period of time that he waits to get to Rome, but you know, it, it, so that brings up an issue. Sometimes there's a promise of God, but there's no timing with it, and we might go, okay, um, now, <laughs> and it may be. Not now, next month, next year, next decade. And we can think of some unusual things like who would be, let me say it this way, if you want to rescue people uh, who are dying in a famine and you want them to go to a country that hates their occupation, uh, would you pick a guy named Joseph who's thrown in a pit and sold as a slave and then falsely accused of attempted rape. Would that be like your guy? You go, that's the most natural way to save Abraham, or, you know, his father and, and all the, the brother. That's a bizarre way. Well, how about Moses? You know, raised, it says he was mighty in word and deed and all the riches. And then he's a failure for 40 years, right? And he's like herding sheep which maybe was pretty good for what he did the last 40 years. But again, like you would think that's the last guy you want to lead millions of people out of Egypt is the guy that failed at age 40 and now he's 80. And so God can take very interesting people. What about the apostles? Let's put Judas aside for a moment. Were all the apostles like Paul, educated at the feet of Humea, Pharisee of Pharisee? fishermen one guy was basically like a terrorist right you know and then you had a tax collector so he was treasonous to the people i mean it's the most bizarre group of men that god could ever pick to say you guys i want to spread my message i mean we could have like thrown darts at a board and picked way better people than this but this is who god wanted which maybe is comforting to somebody like me to go, well, you know, maybe there's hope for me, you know, if God could do that with them. And so God can be very unconventional with how he solves problems. What other lessons do you get from this? Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know all the details. I don't know if it was the city you're born in or if your parents were, you know, Roman citizens, you know, or if it's something like if you're born to Americans on a U.S. military base, you know, that type of thing. But he was very clear about, I was born a Roman citizen and he was a Jew, you know, at the same time. And so that was uh, apparently impressive to the Tribune. However, the details worked out, which... You know, but it was impressive.
Yeah, those two things. Yeah, it, it, it is amazing how valuable it was to be a Roman citizen. I mean, I'm sure there was more to it than this, but at least you weren't going to be beaten without being, you know, found guilty. And, uh, and how valuable that was, but yet that's nothing compared to being a citizen in heaven. And, you know, when, when Paul writes some of this stuff, he's not just writing it as, you know, sort of, a, I've been sitting in my ivory tower thinking about this. I mean, put aside inspiration for just a moment. Paul was a Roman citizen. He was a Jew. He was, you know, all these things. So when he talks about this stuff, you know, we go, wow. Or he talks about being content under all circumstances. Do you guys see any circumstances on the board tonight that you would say, well, that would naturally make me content. <laughs> I like being attacked by mobs. I like being threatened to be beaten illegally. I like, you know, the religious leader to order somebody to punch me in the mouth. Like, that's very, con no, that... So when Paul says this stuff, we go, wow, you know, maybe we should listen to him because of what he went through. What else do you see from this? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Paul was inspired, but there were times where, remember, he, he wanted to go here, and the Holy Spirit said no. He wanted to go here, Jesus said no. You know, and he talks about, I hope to visit you. He didn't know. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. So, you're right, there's a lot of things that even these guys didn't know, and they had to trust in God. And we're going to see over the next, you know, couple of two or three chapters, I mean, he doesn't immediately go to Rome. <laughs> He's stuck in prison for quite a while. And, and how he gets to Rome, not to spoil it, but it's kind of a weird way he gets to Rome. And then we have like the Roman people talking afterwards going, you know, we could have set him free if he hadn't wanted to, you know, and so it's not always a straight line. You know, we that's how we want it, right? You know, start, end, Reality is <laughs> kind of crazy. And he kept his faith. And we have to keep our faith even when things just don't seem to be working out or, or seem to be working out according to our schedule. Any final thoughts? Yes, sir. Yeah, and that, <laughs> it's a very interesting thing. Obviously, in the, the Sermon on the Mount, somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn the other. You know, is that talking about being punched? Is that talking about sort of an insult? Uh, maybe Paul did something wrong here, okay? You might view it that he sort of apologized for it. Um, but I don't really get a sense of <laughs> a strong apology from Paul. Well, yeah. Paul. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with asserting your legal rights. And and if 
it, we might go, well, are you sure about that? Well, Paul did it twice. <laughs> you know, and the, the thing with, uh, with the Tribune is very deliberate. We're going to see, you know, in the next couple of chapters, he does it again. And he's aware of his options and he chooses an option. And maybe he didn't have to choose those options, but he did. And God's will is going to be done no matter what Paul does. And so we'll see that. And uh, so 24 and 25. And I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you.